Welcome to Offshore Explorer with Scott Dodgson. I'm your host, Scott Dodgson. Today I wanted to talk about a subject that uh, has been sort of wandering around in the back of my mind, which ironically is probably the biggest subject when you're sailing um, all the time. And uh, it's usually at the forefront of any discussions and um, of, of how you sail. And that's your mate. And this is titled Mate Wanted. So when you choose a crew, um, or choosing a mate, whether it's a, a guy or a girl, doesn't matter. And depends on, I'm going to explain a couple of different uh, experiences that I've had. I've, I have probably had over, I don't know, 75, 80 different mates over, you know, 50 years of, of being out on the sea. And some have been um, friends. Some have been enemies. Uh, some employees. Some partners. A few lovers. Um, but all very different, bringing different things to the, the sailing because the sailing, whether it's on a big power boat, commercial tug, uh, commercial ship, uh, or just a fast, small sailboat, your crew makes your experience and being the captain is very important on how you handle that and and the first step is is how you choose that mate to be on your on your boat and to work with you. And it's a very different uh, set of parameters in choosing someone to be on the boat with you than say a spouse or say a girlfriend or maybe an employee or maybe that sort of blended line of employee, friend, possibly lover, um, sex partner, you know, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. And my experiences have been, for the most part, uh, very, very good. And I've always sort of gone by the, by the one principle, and maybe it's the principle for for everything and everybody is, is that I always want to choose s someone that's kind to be on the boat. And, and I think we all know that we could, we could look into somebody's eyes and see if they're going to be kind or not. Because I certainly have had some experiences where people kind of started out kind, um, but they really weren't kind to people. Um, they weren't giving people they weren't deferential in any any way and so choosing a mate has is a very sort of complicated and interesting um it, it's a very complicated and interesting thing because a lot of us who are on a boat or you know somebody comes by and Let's say she's pretty and you go, yeah, she wants to go out sailing with us. Yeah, come on. You know, we'll take a pretty girl any day of the week. And and the same goes for if it's a female captain. Yeah, he's pretty handsome. He knows what he's doing. I'll take him. Right? And that's it. That's sort of where we stop. But really, um, you have to look at it a little bit more in depth and you have to consider it. Now, I've hired a lot of people in my day um, from chefs uh, to mates, um, delivery crew, um, all sorts of different kinds of people from different backgrounds with different, um, purpose and why they were on the boat and where they're going. But the one key aspect to all of this, and I'll, I, I joke that there's three aspects to hiring a mate. Okay. I'm bringing a mate onto your boat. First aspect is 24 seven. The second aspect is 24-7. And the third aspect is 24-7. If you're not used to living with people round the clock, day in and day out, and you feel like you have to go hide somewhere, 
you know, just to get your bearings because you can't stand that person after two or three days, then probably you better be more careful about who you hire or who you bring on your boat than anyone else because it's going to screw you. Because 24-7 means putting up with the same person or same people for quite a while. And this happens when you are, say, making a delivery. And it starts really... I started um, originally, I think the first couple of mates I had, um, I was actually a crew member. And as a crew member, I was a crew member um, on a um, freshwater uh, uh, ore boat, 1,000-footer, in, in, in the Great Lakes. And it was for Republic Steel. And I was 18 years old. I didn't know any better. I got my next-door neighbor who was one of the captains, one of the senior captains for the Republic Steel fleet, um, you know, got me the job to, to work. And I, I was the, like the best job for me ever. And I made a ton of money. Um, I mean, at the time, I think minimum wage was somewhere around 95 cents. I think it went up to $1.15. I was making eight fifty an hour, which is union, and I worked eight hours and then got time and a half after that, and then triple time, and weekends were double time, and uh, holidays were quadruple time. I mean, there's all sorts of union rules. I was making more money than my father was making, and he was a professor at, at a university, and that's just the way it is, and I ended up uh, doing a lot of shoveling, um, a lot of chipping uh, of metal and paint, um, grinding, wiping, it, what they call, I was an engine wiper, uh, basically what it meant that I worked uh, for the second engineer, and um, I spent most of my time inside in the bilge, cleaning stuff, painting stuff, and all the rest of this kind of stuff. And my my crew, and I learned very fast, I was 18, and I knew... You know, I couldn't tell these men who were much older than I was what to, you know, I couldn't complain. I was the low man on the totem pole. So I had to just keep my head up. Um, they took the piss out of me constantly, and they made my life extremely difficult, extremely difficult. But I took it, and maybe it's part of the time I know that... Um, I sometimes I joke with people, um, especially younger people, in a kind of kidding, like I'm going to take the piss out of you kind of way, and they just like they freak out. They're like, "Oh my god, oh my god!" They're just it's just not what they're used to. You know, I come from a time where um, people were uh, had thicker skin, and you know, red as being kitted with as being a sign of affection. You know. And um, most of the time, and sometimes it's just pure um, being mean. But, you know, there was, there was more room, lateral room for that kind of, of behavior. Um, people today don't take that. You can't joke with people at all. Um, I have found that everybody is very um, sensitive and bristly. And, you know, I'm the old sailor, so I can, you know, I'll say some stuff. And I have, and I've... I've gotten called out on it um, at the dinner table, to say the least. And um, thank God they just strike it off as the, uh, you know, that's the old sailor in him. Um, but I do get away with some of it. Most of it I don't. But anyway, on the commercial ship, I, I, I spent a lot of time learning how to get along with the people that were on the ship. Many of them were not very well educated. Uh, this, they were family people. They were working really, really hard. This was the limits of their talent, of their job. And I don't mean to be cruel in this sense or even mean in this sense. It's just, you know, they've reached a station in their life, and that's the way they were. But my job, and I realized what my job was very often, was to get along with everybody, to smile, to take it, and to keep on going and not get upset by anything that anybody said. That was that was what being crew was about. And the other thing was I had to learn as many skills as possible. I had to be the person who didn't who wasn't afraid to ask, how do you do this? Um, I don't understand this. Um, what should I do here? Is this the right mixture? 
for doing this. And people can be very short with you. Yeah, that's 10 to 1. Go to this. Okay, but 10 to 1, what? What? What's the one? Where's the one? You know, um, got into a big, huge argument once. Well, I wasn't arguing, but the the other the other guy, Alfonso, he was arguing with me about not understanding, you know, what the mixture for for doing this paint um, and these giant things and how to mix it and everything. He was he was very short tempered um, with me, and you know, I gave him a wide berth, and that was just uh, you know that was a learning experience. You know, I learned to be not take it personal. You know. Just be nice, step back, let it happen, move forward, right? That was what the deal was. I'm not here to make a big, big thing. I'm here to work and I'm here to, um, you know, do the best job that I can. And then I had a job, um, as many of you know, and uh, we had a big discussion with uh, Tim B at C. You could check him out on YouTube. His. Um, Tim was, uh, he's a tugboat captain in, uh, generally in New York Harbor. He gets around a little bit. Um, Tim and I talked about running a tugboat. And, uh, you know, back in the day, uh, I was running a tugboat up in uh, New York Harbor as well. I was still very young at the time. And my mates uh, running this garbage, I was running garbage, literally taking big uh, barges of garbage and running them out to out into the sea about 50 to 75 miles out and then dumping them. Um, that's the way people did before people became sort of environmentally conscious. And I can't believe I did that because my contribution to the garbage at the bottom of the ocean is huge. And I, I feel a bit of regret about doing that. But, you know, it was the job. It was, you know, it was government sanctioned. It was everything. Um, thank God it, it improved. Um, but I had a mate, uh, on a tugboat and, and, you know, when you jump on a tugboat, especially as a captain, um, you know, the, your, your crew isn't, you don't choose your crew so much. Um, you know, the company sort of decides who's what and what is going to happen. So I ended up with this, this guy, Larry, um, who used to walk around on deck uh, without a shirt on all the time? It was this was like in August, I think, and and he when I first took over the boat, and he um, had all his prison sentences tattooed on his back, and 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 he was, to put it mildly, an out and out criminal and insane. Well, we used to take we used to come in and and we used to pick up these barges out in Long Island. And they were full of garbage. And we would tow them. And, of course, they're covered. There's tons of rats on them. So the procedure was, was, you know, to get going and to get them on a long line, drop them, you know, so they would stay out. But the rats would literally come off of the barge once they kind of sensed that they were going out to sea. Their, their survival instincts were tremendous. So these rats would come over. They would come over to bow at a barge right, which was fairly low in the water, walk down the hauser, all right, and the hauser is, is sort of that bridle that holds, you know, the the, the two points, the point, st- point of uh, starboard and, and port, and it comes to a center line, that hauser runs, and it dips down underneath the water and then comes back up to the tugboat, and you, you get this sort of rhythm that the line stays. It's not slack, but it's not taunt, and... You just get the momentum of the barge and behind the tugboat and it just, you just sort of smooth it along and, and, and that's how you, you, you keep it, keep it going. But the rats would go down the, the wire hauser, which was like, you know, like an inch and a half piece of of wire. And they would, they would walk, literally walk underwater along the hauser and then come up and try to get in the tugboat. Well, the mate, Larry, his job was he had a he had a uh, twenty two pistol, and his job when this was happening was to shoot the rats and kill them, which was really great, um, great in principle, um, great fun for the mate, 
And um, as he's pulling this this thing along, because we don't want him to get into the tugboat, right? The mate, the um, rats. So as he's pulling this along, as we're pulling along, and he's shooting these rats as their head pops up over the hauser, and 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 they take a quick breath, and then boom, he shoots them. He was making a big deal about something. I think it had to do with a, a can of beans, um, whether they, the pork and beans or no pork in the beans or just beans or something like that, which I had absolutely no idea what he was talking about. And he turned to me with this pistol and I stepped out of the, the pilot house onto the, there's a platform right outside the pilot house. And I looked down to look down at him as he was, as he was yelling at something and I had him on the radio and I looked down to see what he was doing at the stern of the boat. And he shot at me with the 22, put a hole in the, in the glass of the door. Well, this was pretty intolerable to be, and he was laughing and joking like, ha 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 ha, this is funny. This is that another thing. Needless to say, he was going to be fired. Um, so I, I actually, actually managed to get the pistol away from him, um, not through force, but just by being a little bit clever. And um, I, I told him, I said, you know, you should hang that the pistol and the holster up over, over here on this bollard. And um, so he went. I went down there, and and luckily the first mate. Um, who was a very nice guy, kind of, you know, el- not elderly, but, you know, in his late 40s. He'd been around. He'd, he never really um, passed his captain's license, but he knew everything you needed to know, and he was he was sort of driving the boat. And I went down, and I talked to Larry. I told him, you know, it wasn't cool that you shot at me, and, you know, he laughed, and it was like I could see, like, you know, evil swimming around in this guy's eyes. And I got him to put the holster with the pistol up on a bollard on the back of the boat and then go ahead and 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 secure we have this slide this big chunk of pipe it's like four inches three inches in diameter and it's about three feet long and we would it's got a cut in it so that you could slide the pipe long ways over the hauser and it's greased inside and this the the, the hauser, the wire, could float inside this over the, uh, the bar, which lifted, lifted up the hauser so that when you're towing, that the, the spring in the line would just move back and forth and it wouldn't be on the boat itself. It'd be wearing away the grease and the, um, in the pipe. So you had to pick this thing up with two hands because it was heavy. It was, you know, it was like half inch thick. It was, it was big. And Larry was definitely strong enough to do this so he picked it up and um i happened to be at the controls of the thing and i just gave it a little snap i just go and when i did that line tightened okay and kind of snapped and it forced as he lifted the pipe up to get it around the hauser snapped that line and it snapped the pipe back into his chest and just about knocked him cold i could have broken i could have crushed his chest that was that powerful and he was sort of out of it and laying on the deck with this giant writhing in pain and um i kind of laughed at him and um i took the gun away from him at that point um, we didn't call the cops or anything else like that. This was back in a day when, you know, you didn't call cops. You took care of business yourself. And so I explained to, to my boss what happened. And, um, you know, Larry was gone. He was out. So that's a, this is an example of, of, of just, you know, how you can, two examples of how you can have it pretty rough. And there's some pretty rough characters in the, in the commercial business. Another kind of race inmate is the kind of racing mate. Um, you know, it's that uh, having a race boat. And I had a lot of experience. Um, I used to race International 14s, which we've mentioned before in a couple of other broadcasts. And uh, 
um, my friend George Kors, and he was like my best buddy, and and he and I used to race these together, and um, we had so much fun, and we got along so well. We were just like the brothers we never had because. Both of us had sisters as, as siblings. And um, so George and I ended up having, you know, we were like the brothers. Um, the brothers, too, and racing boats together. We spent majority of the summer together. Um, you know, we used to double date all the time. We couldn't go out on a date, you know, when we were 14, 15 years old um, without each other. It's like we were dating each other. That's how close we were. And it, I look back at it, and I think it's pretty, pretty, pretty funny. But we had a really, really good time. And we got along because we both loved the same thing. We loved the sailing. We loved working on the boat. We loved being a team on the boat. And when you race International 14s, you got to be a team. you got to be, like, thinking. Everything you think of is the other person's thinking at the same time. You've got to be like one brain with two people. And you've got to be very physical. And you have to be aware of the other person's, you know, physical limitations, um, if there are any. And, you know, who does the strategy? Where to go? Who's doing this? Who's doing that? And everything is very finely created. And, and you know, a lot of this sort of obsessive sports stuff that goes on today you know, we didn't have that. There wasn't anybody telling us how to sail. There wasn't anybody telling us, you know, like, you know, how to set how to set a spinnaker or how to set you, where your jib should be and this, that, and other thing. And, you know, we just did it basically by instinct. Uh, we did it by um, trial and error. Um, and when we failed, we laughed. We fell in the water. We laughed. We turned the boat over. We had a big time. It was funny, right? It, we just... It was just adventurous because we were both kind of roguish in that approach to that. So that was just like a really good positive, like crew kind of thing going on for us. Later, I used to do, um, for a brief period when I was in San Diego running um, uh, My Love, which was uh, a Hinkley, and I had done a, uh, my first captain's gig. I did that... Uh, um, podcast, which has been very well received, and thank you for listening. But we used to go out and do what they call beer can races, which I think anybody that has a club or is part of any kind of race, racing situation in a marina anywhere in the world knows, you know, you're out there racing around some some buoys, and, you know, it's just a lot of fun. But there are some people who take the whole thing way too seriously. And a lot of times in racing... You have, um, everybody is, I, I would say, about the same skill level, um, which is they don't have a lot of skill. Um, they kind of know how to sail. They're okay with sailing. Um, they know the ins and outs. They can tie a bowline. They can do a couple of other things. They can generally steer fairly straight. But the, the difference between doing something like that and say the guys running an America's Cup, and maybe not the America's Cup foil guys, because they're in a, they're like they're like Formula One drivers. They're in a completely different class than than any other sort of monohull sailor, because it's just the requirements. Although they cut their teeth on monohull, is is that these this whole uh, racing thing is is about the performance that's in the boat. It's natural performance. Um, and making sure that your timing is right and a very, very simple principle, which is the person who sails the shortest distance between the buoys is the person who's probably going to win because in your class, most boats are pretty equal. Until you start getting into bigger boats um, and there's you're picking up a half a knot here, a third of a knot there, um, the touch on the wheel and how to control the boat, um, your sail trimmer, um, understanding how your sails look, um, whether to you know tighten them up, whether to leave them a little bit luffed. You know, there's a lot of different things that go into racing, and professionally, it's it takes it's there's a lot of stuff to know and to um, and to acquire 
And and you can only do that basically by racing on boats with really super good racers and professional people that know what the hell they're doing. It's it's a whole different world. But for your basic club guy going out there and screaming and yelling at that person, they take on crew based on what? Mediocre skills, um, whether they can sit on the rail, um, do they have any other kind of sailing experience, um, racing experience, sailing experience is one thing, racing experience is another. But I find a lot of times that these these races, and I don't really do races anymore, I have been invited many, 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 many times, and I have... I've declined um, gracefully, I hope, to to say, no, I'm, I don't think so. But I have spent a lot of time racing. And I find that racing crews are, you know, you're better off choosing somebody that uh, doesn't know anything and teach them everything you want to know um, rather than somebody that knows a little something and thinks they know everything. Um this is a huge problem in, in, I think, in any kind of racing. And probably the biggest culprit of the whole thing is the guy who's the skipper. He probably knows less about sailing the boat and racing the boat. Sailing the boat's one thing, racing the boat, um, than some of the crew members. And um, it, But it's his boat, and he can do what he wants. And that's that's really great. So... There's a kind of reverse thing, you know, mate won it, uh, captain won it, um, you know, kind of like, okay, which, who's who, what's what, um, matching them up and being um, sort of uh, understanding the sympathy for that. Now, a lot of times, uh, and I have done this an enormous number of times, which is deliver um, various yachts all around the world. And I love delivering yachts. Delivering yachts is like one of the most fun things I think I could do. Um, you're not under a lot of pressure. Um, sometimes you're under pressure to be somewhere at a certain time, but you make your plan. This is your plan, and then you go for it. And sometimes you get some bad weather, and you got to deal with that. But if you're a fairly competent um, delivery skipper, um, you're going to have your. You're going to find out who your crew is over time and a lot of times some deliveries like I've done deliveries where I've just sort of not been able to find somebody who or my normal guys weren't available and I would say yeah come on I would take somebody I, t I took a friend of mine uh, who I love dearly um, and who I thought and I had misjudged this um, understood all the things that were about sailing and as it turned out, he could barely tie the boat up. And we went for a delivery, and I sort of barked at him. Not sort of, I did bark at him, um, because he needed to tie this line off, and he didn't know. And it really made a point to me that, you know, when you hire a mate, you have to really understand what their skill set is, and you have to have them prove to you what their skill set is is one thing to say, oh, yeah, I've sailed here, I've sailed there, I've done, you know, a couple of passages or a delivery here or delivery there. But were you just sitting in the cockpit or were you actually doing stuff? Show me your skill set, you know. Can you tie, can you tie a knot? Do you know anything about Marlin Spike seamanship? What are the principles? If, if the captain was knocked on the head, could you deliver this boat to where it's supposed to go? Could you go get the... Could you go into the water and get the captain? Can you do a Williamson turn? Do you know what the safety equipment is? Do you know what the safety procedures are? Do you know how to get your uh, you know, life raft out and get it into the water? What is, What are you going to use your life for a life raft? Okay. You know, how do you get a jam sail up in the, you know, in the block in the head? How, how do you, how do you get a sail down? How do you, um, you know, uh, deal with a, a D ring on the deck that's broken? You know, what, what happens when your boom vang freezes and you can't do anything or, or your roller furling explodes? How, how do you, what are you going to do? What, are the, what is the procedure? Um, what is the next step 
that you need to do? What happens if your engine dies? What happens if you start taking on water? What if you get a crack in the boat? What are the things that you're going to have to do? Now, I have found that um, a lot of these kinds of uh, emergency situations, well, they, they don't come up very often, but that when they do, you have to know what to do. And I've had so much experience in sailing that I've pretty much run across most of these uh, types of um, experiences. And I had to go through and actually think about how I'm going to do that. I mean, one of the biggest and most important things is fire. What are you going to do with fire, right? You know, your instinct is if you get a sense that there's smoke is you're going to race downstairs, okay, and and try to find the fire and put it out. That's your instinct, okay? Um, and, and, and oftentimes if it's not too smoky or whatever the case you can, but, but you do that on a larger ship, you're probably going to die. You have to you have to go don your equipment, put your mask on, get down low, crawl along the floor, look to find out where the fire is, and then suppress your fire. And you have to suppress it with the right materials, the right type of uh, fire extinguisher or water or a blanket or whatever the case may be, depending on what is burning. All of these things are really, really important to know. Because you just, you never know. I mean, chances are you're just going to spend, you know, the delivery time just laying in the cockpit, you know, steering boats on auto helm. The captain will change it when he wants the cap, you know, wants to change it. And then you get all excited and get out your fenders and stuff when you go to, you know, put your boat up on the, in, in the dock. And so, understanding the skill set of every crew member is vitally important. And I found that most of the time when I was doing crew, and this this is across the board, is I would spend a lot of time going over procedures while we're sitting in the cockpit, talking sailing, talking about this, doing what-if scenarios with my crew, okay? Talking about, you know, what happens if, if the 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 rudder breaks okay what happens if the rudder just drops off into the ocean you never see it again how are you going to do it so a lot of times they did this rather than making it like a straight up teaching situation which sometimes people get kind of well you can't teach me shit you know i don't i got this thing i i've, I've done this you can't tell me i usually couch it or disguise the lesson and exactly what I'm doing here is I tell a story about it. I said, yeah, well, one time off the coast of Sardinia, and then I start, okay? And that's when I tell the story. So this is a way of finding out what the skill set is because you can just turn and ask the guy in front of you or the girl in front of you, so what would you do if the halyard got jammed up in the head stay? Just leave it at that and see what they say, you know? And a lot of times they won't have an answer because they haven't really thought it through. But you can work it through. You can say, okay, this is how you do it. This is how you do it. Um, we had a very, in the in the marina, this is a couple of years ago, we had a very unfortunate incident in which uh, a guy uh, went up on his mast and he did it by himself. And he got up the top and he had... Um, he had clipped himself in at the top of the mast and he was working um, on the rollers of his uh, head stay. And um, uh, he had a massive heart attack and died. And it, there was no way to get him down using the halyard because he was up there. Somebody had to go up and get him. And um, he was a big guy too. He was, you know, he's probably 240. So he was a big guy. And um, the police had horrible, or not police, but the, the fire department had ladders on a boat that was moving every time somebody stepped on the boat to go up and get this, that get this guy. And I had just, I had just come home and I saw the, the fire department there and all the rest of this kind of stuff. And, you know, they were trying to get this guy down. They eventually got him down. I went over and I offered my services. I said, you know, I can go up and get, you know, 
get him un, unhooked and we can bring him down in a second if, if you want me to. And they, they said, no, 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 we got it, we got it, we got it, we got it. But just seeing this guy hanging, you know, from the top of the mast, dead, dead as a doornail, um, you know, it's, it, this stuff can happen. It happened to uh, a girl I knew um, out of Antigua. She was a crew member, completely green, had absolutely nothing. I've told this story before in um, one of my podcasts, and um, Don't Yell at Me was the podcast. And she went with this this old grouch, and he ended up uh, having to go up the mast and ended up again having a heart attack up again on the mast. She had no idea how to drive the boat. She had no idea how to do anything and that she had to eventually turn around, and I had helped her, if you remember the podcast, um, I had helped her get back in to um, close enough to Antigua so that the Antigua uh, Coast Guard could come out and help her, uh, which they did, and then they sort of accused, <laughs> they accused her of murdering this guy, um, which was clearly not the case. Um, but anyway, it was Little Island Justice kind of thing. And... And, but she was completely, she didn't know how to operate the radio. She didn't know how to even work a wench. He had brought her on this boat just for the very thing that she was just a girl. And I guess he thought he was just, you know, going to be, um, you know, try to get her in her pants or something. So, so the second aspect is, like I said, the first aspect is 24-7. The second aspect is also 24-7. You know, when you're a crew member, and this is for all the guys who are working their way up, and um, I would have to say that I've probably trained from the get-go over the years maybe 50 mates who, and of those 50 mates, probably about 35 or 40 of them who have, and I know some of them are listening to the podcast, and um, Jason, I hope you hear us, um, have become captains. And I've, you know, I've, I've brought them up. They were wet behind the ears, and I brought them up. And I got them their captain's license. I got them their experience. I taught them how to handle boats. I told them, told them what the situations were. And the one key thing is to understand that when you're a crew member, your responsibility is to learn everything that you can possibly learn on the boat. And to be as, even though you may not have the experience, and as I have said before, you know, sailboat and sailing in general, even commercial ships, power boats, it's not about what you know technically. That's a small portion of the inherent knowledge you need um, to be a good sailor, um, you need experience. And to be a great sailor, you need a vast amount of experience. Even the way the Coast Guard measures you for a license, it's about time on the sea, hours at the helm, blue water sailing, where have you sailed? All of this um, is, is about experience, and experience is what counts. It's the heaviest measurement that goes into giving somebody their captain's license. The other stuff you can pick up, but it's your responsibility as a crew member to gain the experience and to be open-minded and not make a conflict about what you're doing. Um, there's nothing worse than having a crew member who is a know-it-all, who thinks he knows better than the captain. He may well know something better than the captain. He in professional circles, um, there are captains, um, and I would count myself in this, that have got a, such a wide variety of experience and have been around so long. It's pretty much not a whole hell of a lot you're going to tell me that you know more than I do. All right? And, and not that I'm, you know, being prideful or anything else like this, but what I'm saying is it's about experience. So I like people that are kind. I like people that want to learn. I like people that understand their job. And that's your, that's your job. Understand your job. I had a mate on a delivery that didn't understand why he was even on the boat. 
He was very panicky. Um, he couldn't steer. His, his name was Lee. We used to call him 60 Degree Lee because he was, you know, running downwind. We were coming from um, uh, the Mediterranean to the Caribbean, and um, the auto helm had broken down and wasn't working, so we had to steer. And it's tough steering in the ocean 24-7 for four, five, six days in a row. It's exhausting for the crew. But some guys have a touch. I mean, you could set, going downwind especially, you could set your general. You could set your main. You can you could get everything, you know, pretty well tuned, okay? And you can just keep your fingers just lightly Use the rudder back and forth because most people don't realize that when they're sailing, they can do all the trimming that they want, but all those all those little contrary adjustments that create turbulence off the rudder is what really slows you down. A professional helmsman, if you look behind him, you'll almost see a straight line of, of that straight green line coming out from behind the rudder. Okay, and and if there's a roll in the swell and all the rest of that is going and there's some adjustments to be made, the adjustments are very small, they're very quick, and they're and they're anticipatory. They anticipate what is going to happen with the boats because on boats, a move right now isn't going to take place in for a minute or two. So you're compounding your moves every time you move the rudder. You have to wait to see what happens, what the results are. Then you can move it again. And you have to keep this in your mind as you're sailing. Lee couldn't do this. So if the boat kind of went over and it started to get a little bit off of course, he would he would pull the, the helm um, violently you know, to port and, and, and then wait for the boat to come back. And then he would violently pull the 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 helm to the starboard and he would violently wait to the thing and it was just like 60 degrees back and forth across the rum line it was terrible but this is this thing that you have to understand both as a captain and as a crew member everybody's going to have you know your partners in the crew are going to have their own skill sets you know there's nothing worse than a chef coming up and saying oh i can steer the boat no you can't go cook all right don't stay away from me all right, there's nothing worse than, say, the engineer coming in and, and offering his services. He could watch. He could take a watch. But you don't want the engineer to do anything but make sure that the engine is running and all the systems are go. All right? The steering, the navigation, that's the captain and the first mate, possibly the second mate, depending on the size of your boat. All right? And this is important when you're just a regular person with a little, you know, sailboat you know, make sure uh, everybody has a role, you know, and the captain should be teaching all the time. He should be teaching these people how to do this kind of stuff. And it's really important because I, as I have said before, especially when couples go out, this is, this is an area that you really have to be careful because guys, you go out with your wife and I'm, I'm going to just, I'm going to reset this idea. The third res- the aspect of this crew wanted, mate wanted, is it just going to be a romance or is it going to be sex? Or is there a story in there to be true partners? Now, this is the part that I think a lot of guys have in their minds is I'm going to get a boat. I'm going to go sailing. I'm going to find a beautiful babe on my boat and I'm going to sail around. This whole misogynistic uh, fantasy um, is just that. And I have to admit very much up front that I, I was really into it. Um, when I first got my CT, um, I was desperate to find a good woman for my boat. Somebody who could cook. Somebody who could, I mean, cook exquisitely. Somebody who um, would do all the hard work and not complain because that's what it, t- it takes a lot of work to run a charter boat and to run a big boat. 
and to keep it clean and bristol and do all the work that you have to do. It's, it's, it's hard work. Okay. And then to be my lover and to have all those aspects of a personality that it would be fun to be with, that it would be fun to share, right? To go out and like, you know, we think about, you know, when you're on a date in the city and you're walking around and you say, oh yeah, we're going to go out to eat tonight and we're going to go clubbing maybe, or we're going to go to a concert or whatever the case may be. This happens every day on a boat when you're sailing around, especially like in the Caribbean or even in the Mediterranean. The South Pacific is is a different kind of feel to it, but it's still sort of generally the same. You're going to want to be with this woman 24-7? So when I started to choose a mate, I was trying to choose a partner, and I was trying to choose a life partner and not sailing mate, although sailing mate crew was in the back of my mind. This was this was in the back of my mind. This was something that that I approached. And th- the first woman that I ran across, um, her name was Florence. She's a French girl. Um, on her worst day, she could create one of the best meals in the world. It would blow your mind. That's how good of a chef she was. Um, she was okay at the sailing stuff, but really she was uh, small. Um, she wasn't particularly strong, but she was somewhat athletic. And I just adored her. I just absolutely adored her. And I spent an entire season trying to woo her and to to try to get her to be in love with me. And she was so sexy um and finally she relented and we had crazy wild sex everywhere on the boat we wouldn't have charters it was just like we couldn't keep our hands off each other i was just like living the dream i was living the misogynistic fantasy of this you know beautiful woman couldn't ask for a prettier woman and athletic and talented and funny and and all the rest of this kind of stuff and and you know great social skills and she she was you know she could break out in a song and sing a decent song and she she had great rhythm and and um you know she 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 was you know infrequently wore clothes um and she was just in her full uh, hormonal womanhood, so to speak. And I was there plucking the flower at its very, very um, uh, essential moment of blooming. And I completely misread the situation. She got off the boat after uh, a season, said thank you very much, and left. I had another mate that, um, and I've mentioned her before, Laura, and some of the other stuff, Laura was again just as fresh and beautiful as you could possibly make. Um, she left because she thought I tried too hard, crushing. And what happened was I was making, I was looking for two things, and it's later this happened. I wanted the romance and I wanted the sex. And I wanted to sail a boat, and I wanted to run my business. I want that's more than two things, but they all sort of fall into one giant thing, which is I wanted the perfect partner for the boat. And I would say that after um, twenty years, eighteen years of chartering and sailing around the world, that um, I never did find the perfect boat partner. Um, I, because of one thing, my needs and my growth made me change. And the point of the boat and the sailing part of the boat become more, became more essential to me than the sexual part of being on a boat with a beautiful woman. And this was a really kind of a key discovery on my part. 
And it didn't take place until very much near the end of um, the, my chartering stuff. And when I went on to take on bigger boats, I became, uh, especially bigger mega yachts, you know, uh, big uh, fed ships and, and Heeson yachts and things like this. The crew became, um, I became a boss. Um, I managed people. Um, I spent most of my time um, at a desk um, doing accounts, um, offering um, you know social advice and how to get along. And the crews were somewhat in my control and somewhat not in my control. And 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 then I eventually found out that you know it was just simply you know, running a business, and that running a business kind of thing is very, very difficult because at the end of the day, you become even more isolated, and that's not what I wanted from sailing, which is why I gave up driving big big yachts. I didn't want to be isolated. If I was going to be isolated, okay, I was going to run a commercial vessel and that and, and, and make some dough. And, and then just have like a schedule. This is my schedule. I'm not going to be on the boat 24-7. I'm going to take the boat and make a couple of runs to Shanghai and back to L.A. And that's going to be it. Thank you very much. I'm going to go home and you know work on my golf game. And that is kind of what I ended up thinking about and doing and separating myself from the business. But the idea of... Posting a request for a mate wanted by a guy alone on a boat has danger written all over it. And not just danger for the woman, but danger for the guy himself. Because he does, he won't train. He is thinking about one thing and he's blended the responsibilities with the concept of romance and the desire for sex. So when you're going to get a mate, and you're looking for a mate, remember this. Kindness. Be clear as to what your role is and what your job is. Constant training. Make this person, because a lot of times this is why this girl's on the boat or why this guy is on the boat, because he wants to get more experience. He wants to be his own captain. He wants his own boat sometime in the future. And this is, this is a big deal. So give him what he wants, because it's going to get you a trained person, and that trained person is going to evolve. As far as the romance and the sex on the boat, there's nothing better than having that perfect moment of sitting in a gorgeous anchorage in a small island in the tropics with a full moon, the water just glittering, the fish running up against and splashing, and a beautiful meal, glass of wine, and a beautiful woman that is so conversant and intelligent and all the rest of this stuff. They exist, but they probably don't exist for you, which is kind of a negative, but think about it that way. And I'm also going to stretch myself in this. And I've said this before. Guys, get a boat first. Then get your woman. Get your mate. Train her up. Make her better than you as a captain. Because a lot of times if... And I've had a few people um, who have consulted with me and, and, and I have consulted with them. Couples that uh, do very well in the... Um, day-to-day uh, business on land in an apartment or in a house, and then they chuck everything and they all they jump on a boat and this is going to be their new dream. That woman, if she doesn't adapt and change and understand what that 24-7 aspect of it is and understand the need and ability to um, be flexible and to constantly be aware of what the other person is going through, their needs, their desires, their problems, their pains, their physicalness, what's happening. If, if, if you can't be aware of that and be subordinate 
in a positive way, this is not going to work for you as far as being on a boat. So my suggestion is, you know, be aware of the 24-7 aspect. I want to thank you. That's it for today. Um, I want to also thank uh, Tommy Twang for the music up front, um, as well as my dearest, Paulette McWilliams. You could find her album, um, uh, A Woman's Story, anywhere you get music. I have been working on a new book, so next week I will not, uh, I will not be broadcasting next week. Uh, I'm taking a week off because I have the publishers asking me to do a ton of stuff, and I, I have uh, a limited bandwidth um, in terms of doing all this stuff. But I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Um, please like. Um, please share. Just hit share and share it to your friends. We would greatly appreciate it. Um, this is uh, Offshore Explorer with Scott Dodgson. Um, thank you. Um, I wish for you to have some calm seas and gentle winds. Thank you. <laughs>